Good evening. Today is the 24th day of November 2016, Darshan Day, also known as Siddhi Day. And we are here with our brother Alok, who will share with us the significance of this day. On the 24th November 1926, the mother saw Sri Aurobindo emerge from his room in the evening. She knew immediately that something had important had happened in the history of the earth and universe. Actually, since uh, August that year, there were indications of something special that is going to happen. And we see it in Sri Aurobindo's evening talks. First on his birthday, 15th August 1926, when Sri is asked what is the secret of this transformation, how to get there. And then one of the disciples says, it is through the psychic that we can glimpse the supramental. Sri says, yes, you got that. So the another disciple says, any other. Then Sri says, yes, but it will be difficult for you to understand. Then at the insistence of the disciple, he says that you have to discover your higher self and through the higher self, you must come in touch with the plane of the gods. So the disciple asked Sri what does that mean? And Sri said, I told you that, <laughs> that you won't understand. <laughs> I told you that you won't understand. So, you know, we see very interestingly, Actually, 24th November is a very interesting day of transition in the yoga of Sri The first transition comes soon after 1908, when Sri glimpses the supramental oneness through the psychic door. What he called as Vasudevam, everywhere, Sarvamiti, in the bar, in the prison, in the bowl, in the judge, in the advocate. The mother has beautifully explained that this experience is the experience of supramental oneness. He sees the one divine everywhere, in everyone. And this was glimpsed through the psychic door. Till then, we see that Sri is, uh, his yoga is following along many lines of the traditional yogas, many lines simultaneously. And he's being flooded with experiences after experiences, the experience of the world mother, the experience of the vacant infinite, the experience of silent Brahman, and so on and so forth. Not to speak of the experience through pranayama that he has, mm. of lines and lines of poetry descending into him. And this goes on till he touches a peak. And that peak is the first glimpse into the supramental oneness, which is just hinted in the Gita. The, there are three points in the Gita where Sri Krishna uh, as my dear friend Chote Narayanji used to say, that Sri Krishna knocks at the gates of the supermind but does not open it. <laughs> and of course, he leaves it uh, for himself to open it much later. And one of them is where he says, I am the unmanifest and the manifest, both together. Another place where he speaks of this experience. Vasudevam Sarvamiti is the rarest of the rare who has a glimpse of this. And the third is where he gives the great secret, Sarva Dharman Parityaja Mame Kam Shadnambraja. It is only through an absolute unconditional surrender to the divine that you can be freed from all sin and evil. This sin and evil is not about just the inner being, but that comes by the very fact of being born into matter, which is what Christ also refers to. The sin is not the way we understand sin, but the very fact of birth into matter is a birth into imperfection. So he knocks at the gates but doesn't reveal it. And we see the story of Sri Krishna connecting with Sri Aurobindo very interestingly on this day. So 1908, Sri Aurobindo's yoga began to depart into other realms, uncharted realms, new territories. And for the fulfillment of that yoga, because it was a new yoga for the earth, we see that Sri has an Adesh and he withdraws into total seclusion in Pondicherry. And there he starts this new adventure and the yoga is given to him. The limbs of the yoga, the new yoga is given to him by Sri says 
the guru of the worlds he gives him the limbs of the yoga because this that yoga is not yet known to the earth so he must practice it and in that yoga for a long time he is now moving from one plane to another he is not taking up the vedic yoga and he is fulfilling it to its utmost so he moves from one plane to another and as he moves something happens which is beautifully described in savitri and of course one of his poems which had never happened in any of the terrestrial yoga so far and that is the descent of a higher consciousness what the yogis could do at the most in the vedic yogas they could ascend into the rays of the sun and live from there but there was no corresponding descent in the mind life they aspire for it but the the aadhar is not ready there was an effort and a great effort no doubt about it now shobindo starts experiencing the descent so higher and higher levels of consciousness begin to descend and each descent opens a way to further ascent so it's a continuous process beautifully described in savitri and i'm sure many of us experience it in our life that as there is a descent something gets liberated from the clutches of old nature something of the old consciousness escapes the boundaries of ignorance and is integrated into the higher self that's how shobindo describes it in the life divine as ascent and integration this goes on for a long time long time really long till 14 16 years, 16 years 16 years till finally the entire range of higher consciousness beyond the mind that is the over mind consciousness descends completely into matter now contact with the higher planes has been there people have glimpsed divinity of krishna there have been influence of krishna people have even experienced partial manifestations of krishna consciousness like chaitanya mahaprabhu and shobindo testifies to it but that is very different it's like an influence coming touching coloring from something tying itself onto matter and a material body which is what shobindo was striving towards because only if the over mind plane could come down and fix itself to earth can it prepare matter for the supramental descent and people were experiencing this pressure of higher and higher consciousness and the manifestation of the gods right, right. you know in november october they felt an intense pressure some gods were descending into the consciousness of the disciples for example varuna into nalini das uh, you know uh, being mitra the god of love and harmony into amrit das being so it was happening all the time mother was in touch with those over yes all the gods, gods. and she would ask them that you are descending all right but will you fix yourself into earth matter and tie yourself and they would say no 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 that only man is capable of that <laughs> of course man is capable of that is my addition uh, but not without reason <laughs> mother says only man is capable because he contains in him the psychic spark so they said we will help but we will not tie to the body even shiva the great god he said i'll help from above and i'll incarnate when the supramental world is ready and established till then i will help but not tie myself to any human body and then mother says except for krishna he agreed to tie himself to a physical body because it was his work that was being done and he tied himself to shirbindu's body now what does it mean that's 24th november it's not just the over mind plane descending and preparing matter but the being of krishna coming and tying so there are two things involved in this now if we look at shri krishna's work shri krishna is anandamay but he had come to because earth is not ready for the ananda he had come to open the way up to the over mind so many people when shobindo says this thought that oh shri shri krishna is over mind shobindo is super mind so one is inferior to the other typical human logic despite today we are reading that message <laughs> that uh, this is the logic of absurdity uh, well shri krishna is the eternal divine who had taken a poise in the over mind because earth had to ways of earth had to be opened up to that that itself was a big deal 
and that is why he doesn't go beyond he knocks at the gates but returns back because it's too early too premature earth has to be ready for that so he prepares the consciousness of the earth but the beauty is and the interesting part is because she krishna is anandamaya he starts his leela upon earth with ananda if you read shri krishna's stories the first part vrindavan is all ananda his you know dance with the gopis and the gopis the play even the destruction of the asuras there it's all full of delight and charm but obviously the earth is not ready and the mother says that that shri krishna came to bring freedom and delight but man was not ready and therefore he had to therefore vrindavan still does not exist upon earth so he did it but saw earth is not ready so suddenly he vanishes one night which shobindra has said was a great event one of the four great events shri krishna sudden departure from vrindavan earthly vrindavan and then no because for them the birth and death of a human being is nothing it's not even a fraction of a moment and for them it's simply the uh, body which is destroyed and the evolution goes on so they don't really care much about that mother calls them typal typal beings so they are typal beings and well titans are also typal beings and uh, these beings don't evolve to evolve they have to take human birth so in this evolutionary history of earth the gods have played the role of influencing mankind to turn towards something higher something more beautiful something nobler but because human beings have a psychic being time to time we will see in the history of earth spiritual evolution that there are beings who have gone beyond the gods and they talk about it in the upanishads they talk about it and there is a famous story which mother used to love and enjoy and when the film was shown she was very amused the story of uh, sati anusuya it's from the indian thought where a lady by the power of her tapasya and what kind of tapasya simply a one pointed love towards her husband and the practice of truth that's why she is called as the great sati by the practice of truth she goes to such an extent that even the trinity she is able to change them into little babies mm. they come to test her that you know whether she is really a chaste woman or not now this is not so simple as you know chastity is not of the body but of the mind nonida speaks about it and when they come to test her they give a strange kind of situation that you have to make us eat food sitting in your lap and you would be without any dress and she has committed and she says fine but she has a trick up her sleeve and she turns them into little babies makes them sit and feed them and says go and sleep so now the three great goddesses suddenly realize that their husbands are no more coming back and they come and they say that look we are uh, we are sorry it was we who felt that how can a human being be greater than us goddesses and we realize that you know we were wrong that human beings have something in them which takes them beyond the gods but now our problem is about our husbands <laughs> and she tells them well you find out for yourself they are all lying there you recognize yours and take them home <laughs> now when this film was shown mother was very happy and she said the beauty of this film is that human beings can do it they can go beyond the gods because they have a psychic being so what was happening the general humanity was shaped by the overmind gods but few human beings had found a path to go beyond these gods the great seers the great initiates and this secret was guarded in schools because it would upset the creation so the rest of the humanity was still under the influence of the gods they would worship them and the gods would help them to grow depending on the kind of god and this was the relation sometimes some gods would partially incarnate in some human beings the stories are there in indian thought and they are there in uh, everywhere in the world but in indian thought is being given a lot of prominence for instance in mahabharata at all crucial junctures partially these gods have sent their emanations in some specific human beings arjuna himself the recipient of the gita is supposed to have been an ansha avatar of indra so that's how they would um, help the evolutionary march of mankind but the problem was one they were influencing from above they never directly descended into matter except for krishna the anandamaya and he came 
took an earthly body, the supreme, that's how the mother puts it, puts it, took an earthly body, but then withdrew and stayed like the avatars. Avatars never completely withdraw. But his work was not to change matter, but to show a way to the over mind and past beyond that. He gave a very wide way, the way of works and the triple path, not to go into that. Now the first thing was that these gods must descend and fix themselves into material creation and work there. So far they have been in their cozy homes and influencing from there. <laughs> so as the, in any case, when you pull the supermind down, they are bound to come closer. It's a pressure from above. They also feel the heat. <laughs> so the mother describes so beautifully that for a few months before November 1926, there was a pressure for these gods to descend. Now, what was happening when these gods began to incarnate? People couldn't bear it. We have the famous example of Tirupati. Now, one of the four great gods whom Shurabindu wanted to descend, the four uh, guardians of the supramental world. And Tirupati, when he received that, he lost his mind. He began to believe that he is God himself and he had to be sent away. There are so many letters of Shurabindu with regard to Tirupati. It is one of those stories of the dangers of you know, yoga. And he had to be sent away from Pondicherry and arrangements were made to for him to stay in Andhra, where he lived after that throughout. And though he was in touch with Shurabindo, time to time he would get the impulse to come here. But Shurabindo had told very clearly that you have to stay there now. Of course, the journey doesn't stop. This is just for the sake of completion. Tirupati would come again and the yoga is never lost. <laughs> Somebody who has gone to that extent. But this became a dangerous thing because when these gods began to incarnate, uh, it swells the ego. And so, very interestingly, in one of the conversations, Shubhinda would tell that, you know, previously I thought um, it's not safe to talk to you about this plane of the gods because it would be dangerous. But now not to speak about them would be dangerous. Now, it's very interesting that why Shubhinda made that remark. Yes. Well, previously to speak about them would have been dangerous because everybody would romanticize and fantasize, oh, I'm this God. <laughs> and you know, today so many human beings start believing that they are gods and uh, what happens to the ego is, you know, legion. Stories are legion about that. It's so easy. And Mother has said the dazzles of the over mind are so dazzling that anybody can mistake them for the uh, true divine. And she says that, uh, Suvindu says that at one point, even for me, I felt this is it. Till he renounces that and goes further. So he would not speak about the gods because people would start believing that they have grown into that god and this god. And particularly in India, there are so many stories and everybody is some god <laughs> somewhere there. But later on, because these gods were descending, for instance, in um, Nalnida, Varuna had descended. In Amrita Brahma, the, the God with the word of creation. So this was happening and um, not to speak about them was dangerous because people may lose their way. So Sri cautioned that what is necessary uh, if you really want to contain these experiences is to one freedom from the ego. You have to now more than ever before work towards getting free from the ego and the desire element. Because if it mixes, the whole experience will turn towards a kind of aggrandization of the ego and will end in disaster. So he was preparing everybody because he saw what is happening. And then of course, the mother, when she saw these gods coming and touching the earth, she asked them, would you like to participate in the supramental creation? Yes, mother. Yes, mother. No, it's not enough for you to be up there. Would you like to incarnate, fix in matter? No mother, no mother. <laughs> so beautifully she describes that they would come and sit on the ledge, all the Trimurti and all of them. But nobody would want to take a body, fix himself in, in a body because it means tremendous limitation. Coming into a body is a great renunciation for the gods. So she gives the story of Shiva. He says, I will help in the work. And she describes beautifully with his gold red body and tall touching the ceiling. And then he says, yes, I will help in the new creation. Uh, what would you want me to do? And the mother says that, you know, I want this physical ego to go away. 
the ego which is inbuilt in the very cells of the body. And Shiva says, yes, I will do it for you. And she goes to Shirbindo and says, you know, I have a very funny feeling that all my cells are getting scattered. Because he is the great, you know, destroyer, Tandava. And Shirbindo says, not yet. And you know, we know about Shirbindo's power of the word where when he would say, yes, the super mind will descend. And when he said, not yet, of course, the mother doesn't present it this way, but I was amazed. You know, when I read this account, that immediately everything stopped. We have heard about Shiva's word, you know, he grants a boon. But someone overruling that word, not yet. So he did not deny Shiva's boon, he postponed it in terms of time. Much later, the mother would have this experience of impersonalization of the body. And she would recollect once again and say, Shiva had granted me this, but that was not the time. And I understand it was premature and much later it would take place. So it's one of those very fantastic stories. Yes. And during that time when Shiva said, I will help, but I will not take birth. I will incarnate when supramental creation is already there. He says of all the gods, only Krishna consented. And she says that Krishna uh, an incarnation of the Supreme from the past came and agreed because Krishna the Anandame, Krishna of the Kurushetra, Krishna of the Vaishnavas who is a delight baby, they are all different aspects of Krishna. For instance, when Shobindo received the Gita in the jail, uh, a disciple asked him, was it the Krishna of the Kurushetra or was it the Krishna of Vrindavan? And Shobindo said it was the Krishna of the Kurushetra. Now here she specifies that Krishna who was the past incarnation of the Supreme, a past formation of the incarnation of the Supreme, he comes and he says, I will, I agree to fix myself in an earthly body to help the evolution. It's amazing. And then we see that he, mother says, I saw him for a long time. He was hovering around Shurabindo.